All right, uh, let's cover what we can here on, um, on images of the church. Images of the church. Um, and so this is session three, which I think is in your Google Classroom. And Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, now you are a body of Christ in individually members of it. Mark Dever notes, the richness of descriptions of the church teaches us that no single image can comprehend all aspects of the church. So what we're going to look at in this outline is how the Bible describes the church. What are the images? How do those come together to uh, compose the, rit the richness of what we have in God? Everett For Ferguson <coughs> says, Of first importance, it must be noted that the characterizations of the church scriptures bring it into relationship to the deity. Some to God the Father, people of God, family of God. Some to Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. Christ is the vine. Uh, we as his sheep. Some to the Holy Spirit, community filled with the Holy Spirit, the temple in which God dwells through the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, all the principal descriptions of the nature of the church give prominence to Jesus as Lord over the church. That's something we talked about uh, and we'll talk about more. So uh, as we look at the images of the church, we're supposed to see how those fit into the Godhead, um, which is a beautiful thing. Um, so we see three other concepts clearly uh, intimated in these descriptions. First, the relatedness of the church. So we're a, a family. We're related as a family. We're a body that works together and all are related together. We're a building uh, made up of uh, different parts that relate together to form one whole. Uh, so we're vitally linked as related together. Uh, but we also see the growth of the church. So the, the church is a body uh, that's growing. It's a building that's being built up. It's a flock that's being added to. It's a vineyard that is being grown and producing and yielding fruit. Um, all, are, all of those images are built or they grow. There's a dynamic nature to their existence. But also these images represent the mission of the church. Uh, as a body, we're moving and acting. As fellow workers, we're uh, tilling to the soil of gospel ministry. Um, and we're expecting to be doing what the head of the body is doing. So again, as we look at these images, we're wanting to see how there is connection and relatability in the uh, image to others and to Christ, uh, how there is growth that's supposed to happen through these images and how they're expressed and how there's mission. So we are going to start with the family of God. So a family that feels like home. This description emphasizes our particular relationship to God as his people. As his adopted children, we call God our father and Jesus Christ our brother. It's also an image that invokes our inheritance in Christ. So just as a family would have received, and one of the big components of uh, family life was receiving an inheritance as the son of a family, so too we're supposed to see our relationship in the family of God is evoking an image of as a family, we have a natural inheritance as a family member. And also speaks to our relationship to one another as not uh, individuals, but primarily as brothers and sisters. So Bruce Milne says this, this image reminds us of our high privilege were raised by his grace to the glorious stat status of sons and daughters of God. It speaks, too, of the character of our mutual relationships as members of one family and challenges us to trust our Heavenly Father to meet all our needs. So Ephesians 2.19, 
You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of (coughs) the household of God. Uh, God as our Father, Paul goes on in Ephesians 4, uh, that one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Um, And so as we look, uh, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, Romans 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Isn't that amazing? Um, Provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. 1 John 3, 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And and notice the emphasis here, and so we are. Wayne Grudem says, the fact that the church is like a family, increase our love and fellowship with one another. So as we look at this concept of the family of God, um, we're supposed to obviously see a number of things. And, and so personal application with that, as we look at a family, we've obviously received the Spirit of God in adoption to cry out, Abba, Father. I think it begs a question as we ponder what it looks like to be the family of God in the image of the church. What does that look like in our prayer life coming to God as our Father? Um, and so um, whether you're uh, earthly father, whether you have any children um, or not, the, the image we have through, uh, through Scripture is being able to come and make requests to a God as our Father who's uh, eager to answer our prayers. So as we think of the church as the family, are your prayers individually and are the prayers of this church corporately looking to plead with and ask your father for good things. Sometimes I feel like uh, prayers of the saints are, are uh, almost like approaching a king on their throne. And, and that's, a, that's not a bad image to have, but if that's the only image we have of prayer to God, I think it's a deficient image in and of itself. Whereas instead, I I would love to see, and and people who have, I think, a real pronounced gift of prayer, gift of faith in their praying, you you see this element of them coming to God as Father and really understanding the relationship that God as Father knows what's best for me. And so if I'm asking my, my dad, my father, for something that's not good for me, he's not going to give it. But... Uh, I, I want my children, I've got four girls, um, I, I want them to come and ask their dad for things. I want them to ask because they know that I love them. And the way they ask should, should not be, uh, I would be really, really sad if the way my children came and asked me for things was a, a demeanor of almost me being separated from them in a way that they, they felt like they had to come in reverence and respect in their, um, in their uh, request from me. Um, now, again, there's a lot of images that we're going to go through. Uh, coming in in uh, awe and, and fear is a biblical image that we hold to, absolutely. But God as Father means we can come and make requests respectfully to our loving Father in a way that really does ask out of love because we understand he's the father of his people um, that says, you know, please, uh, you know, dad, my my kids, dad, can we, can we go outside and and play together? Absolutely we can. Sometimes I feel like the church can come in and, and in that same scenario can go, it's a beautiful day outside. Lord, if it's your will, for us to be outside and, and to play in, in, in grace, then let it be. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's, it, it, you, you want to go, like, we're asking a good thing. And again, in, in, there are times where my kids can come and say, hey, Dad, 
can we go play outside? And I understand that we're about to start getting ready to go out somewhere. And so I'm going to deny their request uh, because I have insight, wisdom, and knowledge that they don't have. But I don't want them to then change how they ask me to go play outside next time. I still want them to come up the next day and say, hey, Dad, can we go play outside together? Um, I, their tone shouldn't change the next day because the request was denied the first time. Um, and so as we look at God as our Father uh, and us as the family of Christ, I think the first practical application point is do we come to God and, and bring our request to him in a way that looks like a loving child to a, a, a loving and generous father? And are we leading our churches uh, in that kind of model of prayer? Um, so that would be application point number one. And then the other thing that is a clear application of the family of God is as we relate to other believers. Um, do I genuinely see the other person coming to church alongside me as a sister? And if so, what does that beg of me in terms of how I protect, how I ask questions, how I engage her in conversations as a sister in Christ? Um, and so lots of categories of, of wisdom and uh, love and respect that go into that. But um, it, if there's a concern, I think sometimes believers can see one another uh, first and foremost as another sort of disconnected, objective person of God and not as this is my sister in Christ. Uh, there's a, a, a family element, a family love, a family appreciation and conversation that looks like someone that I'm connected with in a family. So without belaboring the point too much, uh, God's family has implications. It has implications in how we pray. It has implications on how we do community and fellowship as a family. Um, all right, God's flock. <coughs> so, um, so as God's flock, we're a people that experience our God's and Savior's care. So this description emphasizes God's care for and protection of the church. Uh, sheep. Uh, are the most helpless, they're the dumbest and the most defenseless creatures um, on the planet. Um, and uh, and they, they have to rely completely on their shepherd for their survival. Um, so this invokes for us all the shepherding images of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, Yahweh is portrayed as the good shepherd. In the New Testament, he's portrayed as, as the father, as father and Jesus is portrayed as the good shepherd. Uh, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery says this about this image of shepherd or flock of God. The helplessness of a sheep helps to explain the actions and qualities of a good shepherd, who in the Bible is a case study in care and compassion. It was the task of the shepherd to lead sheep from nighttime protection in a sheepfold on safe paths to places of grazing and watering. Excuse me. Shepherds were thus providers, guides, protectors, and constant companions of the sheep. <clears throat> they were also figures of authority and leadership to the animals under their care. One quick point here: if you're if you're looking for um, for notes as you're looking to come into pastoral ministry, um, write these down and meditate them. Provider guide, protector, companion. Is that what you are as a pastor? Um, if we're under shepherds, and we'll get to that later today or tomorrow, as pastor is shepherd. Um, and I know you've covered that. Anyway, um, is, that, is that guiding our pastoral care? Um, Bruce Milne says, the image underlines the utter dependence of the church on its head and Lord, uh, the, and the compassion and love which the Lord expresses towards us and his commitment to God protect and nourish his people. So obviously Psalm 23 one um, gets a lot of airtime and rightfully so. Psalm 23 is just, oh, it's good. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
I can't tell you how many times I've prayed just that verse and specifically said, Lord, I want so many things right now. I want my own satisfaction. I want rest. Uh, I want my kids to stop annoying me for five minutes for me to have peace. Of, I mean, there's so many things that I want. Um, I can't tell you how many times, thousands of times, I'm quite sure, I've prayed, Psalm 23, 1, you're my shepherd, please help me not to want. And, and just seeing this image of uh, God as our shepherd, why should I be in fear? Um, so I could preach there, but I won't. Uh, Psalm 95, 7, for he is our God, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Um, uh, so again, that image, we're not uh, only, uh, he's not only our shepherd, but we're in his pasture. Uh, and the sheep of his hand, I think there's, there's a lot, if you're preaching Psalm 95, there's a lot you can pull out of that image of we're not just sheep in a pasture, we're sheep in his hand. He, he is holding on to us. Again, a sermon there that I refrain from. Psalm 100, know that the Lord, he is God, he is who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Isaiah 40, 11, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead, that, lead those that are with young. Tender compassion. Uh, a great book I'd recommend. Uh, a lot of things that can be said for it, uh, both positive uh, and nuances. But the book Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland, uh, we just finished a Sunday class at our uh, church where we taught through that book. Um, four weeks, just a high-level overview of it. But how God's disposition towards us is that of love, gentleness, care, and guidance, not of... Uh, there's a reason we're not going to make it through all these outlines, and it's me. I'm, I'm seeing the common denominator as I, um, all right, um, Ezekiel 34, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. John 10, I am the good shepherd, Jesus, re referring to himself now. How great is it? I mean, anyone who denies the deity of Christ, look at the New Testament. Uh, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and they and my own know me. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again, the de uh, again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive, as pastors, as under shepherds, the unfading crown of glory. So we as the flock of God, God nourishing, care, caring for our people. We're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like pastorally as you're an under shepherd, but as a sheep, as the people of God come as the flock of God, do we have categories for coming for protection to God as our shepherd and for feeding from God as our shepherd? So as we're looking at application points on each one of these, think through what does it look like to really view God as our shepherd, not only as our father, but as someone who, like David, is going to fight off lions to protect us. Um, what does it look like as we're afraid and, and, and backed into a corner of insecurity and possible danger to see God as the protector of his sheep? <clears throat> what does it look like for us as we have spiritual dryness and our souls don't feel nearly as enlivened by the word of God? Who hasn't experienced that situation where you just don't feel like things are clicking? What does it look like to see God as the person who feeds his sheep? So those are some application points there. Any, any questions on God, uh, God's flock, that image? No good. Uh, God's temple. Um, uh. Uh, this description emphasizes God's dwelling among us through the Spirit. His presence is not limited to a building as it was in the Old Testament, but is ever-present uh, and among His people. Also emphasized is Christ as the foundation of the church in whom uh, all else is built. 
So this, uh, fi- uh, this image of us as the church, as God's temple, uh, emphasizes the fact that the church is holy and inviolable. Uh, vi- um, it, in, I don't think I spelled that right. Uh, we're not going to be able to be polluted. So just as the temple in the Old Testament had all sorts of rules, regulations for nothing unclean coming in, the priest having to cleanse themselves, prepare themselves for walking into the temple and the Holy of Holies. So too, this image emphasizes the fact that the church is holy. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit imparts to the church an exalted character. Edmund Clowney says this, At Pentecost, the Lord came to take possession of his people, filling his spiritual house with his presence. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's dwelling, uh, God, God's spirit dwells in you? Uh, Romans 8, 9. Yes, however, you are, where am I? Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, again, uh, we are God's fellow workers. That's also an image. It's not one that we're exploring uh, today, but that, that is another image we could add to it. You're God's fellow workers. You're God's field, God's building. Um, saying Christ is ahead of this, Ephesians 2, 21, in whom the whole structure, uh, that temple imagery, the whole structure being joined together, the relational element of a temple, all the bricks coming together. Charles Spurgeon's quote from yesterday, if any individual uh, brick says he doesn't need to be joined for a house, well, that is a good-for-nothing brick. Um, uh, so the whole structure, all of the bricks, all the people of God being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Um, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, as you come to him, a living stone, Jesus Christ, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up. There's growth there. There's activity. Again, as we're looking at relationship, and growth, there's growth in what's happening in the church. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to a holy priesthood. Again, that temple imagery. Um, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Bruce Milne, again, the image of the church, this image of the church, underlines the essentiality, underlines the essentially spiritual character of the church as a creation of the Holy Spirit and Christ's central place as foundation and cornerstone and stresses the fundamental mutuality of the Christian life in which experience and service of God are realized and experienced through our, identi- our, our identification with each other as living stones in the temple of God. Wayne Grudem, the picture of the church as God's new temple should increase our awareness of God's very presence dwelling in our midst as we meet. Uh, there's so much more to be said for uh, for. Uh, the, the God's temple here. But are we aware that God's very presence is in our midst as we gather together as a church? God's vineyard. Um, this image emphasizes our vital, life-giving connection to Christ and the fruitfulness that is expected and, uh, and possible as a result of our connection. Psalm 80, verse 8. A brought, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. John 15, 1, talking, uh, Jesus speaking here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Uh, There's more there that can be said in John 15, obviously, but as we're looking to connect ourselves in fruitfulness, there's no way that the church is going to be fruitful unless it's connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ. Bruce Milne, 
This image of the church as a vine speaks of God's care for the church. The church's total dependence on its Lord for its life and existence and his concern for its purity and fruitfulness in the world. Uh, Wayne Grudem, the image of the church as branches in a vine should cause us to rest in him more fully. Uh, Just as a branch isn't supporting itself, it's connected. We shouldn't feel like as a church that we're somehow supporting all of our own efforts in all the things that we choose to do, not to do, plan, not to plan, is going to ultimately be the end-all, be-all of the fruitfulness of our church. We need to find ourselves resting in Christ as the vine. The other component of this that I'd want to have as application is sometimes in God's kind providence, trimming needs to happen for more fruitfulness. So in your pastoral ministry and in your church, there are going to be things that need to be pruned away, and that hurts. Uh, It's unpleasant. Uh, No no branch wants uh, hedge clippers to come to it. But for more fruitfulness, that is going to be a reality of your pastoral ministry where uh, many things could be said there. But uh, just realize that as we look at the image of the church as, uh, as God's vineyard, uh, a good, a, a, a good uh, vine dresser cuts away branches at times to see more fruitfulness. Uh, if that's not a reality of suffering and pastoral ministry that you have, it needs to be. Uh, because there will be pruning that takes place. Christ's body. Uh, The description emphasizes our vital union with him and our dependence upon him as our head, as well as our responsibility to obey him as our head. So uh, the name is not, we talked about this yesterday, it's not only applied to the church universal, but it also uh, applies to single congregations. We're, We're not supposed to see that a single congregation is not moving as an entire body. It isn't, yeah, uh, it is a whole body in and of itself, and it's also a part of the larger universal church. Um, It also emphasizes, um, particularly in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, our dependence on one another for proper functioning of the body and our mutual care for one another. Um, We'll get to some of those in just a second. There's a dual aspect of one body, but many parts. Um, So Romans 12, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we throw, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. First Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Ephesians 1, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who lives all, who fills all in all. Ephesians 4.12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. This image is just repeated uh, over and over. Uh, Just, yeah, Christ is the head of the church, even as a husband is the head of his wife. Uh, Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Um, two quotes here, and then we'll get into the application. Bruce Milne, uh, his being the head implies that all our life and nourishment flow from him. We live out of him, from him, through him, and unto him. It's a great quote. Wayne Grudem, the metaphor of the church as the body of Christ should increase our interdependence on one another and our appreciation of the diversity of the gifts within the body. Um, I'm going to uh, 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 cover a little bit as we talk about um, um, as we talk about membership and giftings, how that how that fleshes itself out. But I would have as a category with this: uh, what does it look like to really recognize where your brothers and sisters, as we talk about the family of God, can see more fruitfulness as we talk about the vineyard of God in their activity as particular members and parts of the body of God, the body of Christ. 
So as we look at our siblings in the Lord and want to see more fruitfulness from them uh, as they look to live the Christian life, how do we then encourage and recognize where their gifts come into play that are different than ours and encourage them into those gifts? As we look at those images coming together into a full picture, those are some of the things we want to keep in mind. Uh, Christ's bride, uh, and then uh, I'll pause for some questions, and then we'll grab some grub. Um, so R.B. Cooper, uh, Kuiper, I, I'm not positive how to say his last name, I think he's German, um, in the process of cleansing Christ, uh, in the process of cleansing, Christ does not leave his bride to her own devices. Praise God for that. In that case, not only would her purification never be perfected, Contrarywise, her filthiness would only increase. But in his great love, the Lamb has made provision for her cleansing. He gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Uh, Brian uh, Habig and Les Newsom say this, The Bible is clear. Jesus has honeymoon affections for his bride. The Bible is clear. Jesus has honeymoon affections for his bride. Even in the midst of our sinful ugliness, his delight for his people is evident. Before the urgency of wedding photographers came along, it was tradition that the bride and groom would not see each other uh, on the day of the wedding. Our heavenly bridegroom, however, would not think of being apart from his church. No, he not only stays with us through our engagement on earth, but he is the one who adorns us with beauty and makes us fit for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's a honey quote right there. Um, the descri- this description of Christ's bride particularly emphasizes God's unique love for his church and his commitment to bring her to perfection. This was a common Old Testament theme with Israel's idolatry being likened to adultery. In Hosea, we, we have an extended analogy of Hosea's unfaithful wife. So we're not only seeing Christ in the church as this image of, uh, of a wedding. We also see this in the Old Testament, Isaiah 54. Uh, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the God has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Isaiah 62, for as, young, as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry, uh, marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Jeremiah 2, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Ephesians, two, uh, Ephesians 5 is a very familiar passage uh, as it talks about the bride of Christ. Uh, Revelation 21, uh, the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, I have a divine jealousy for you. Uh, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom and and the consummation as a wedding feast. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. An angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Again, two quotes here from Milne and Grudem. The image underlines that God's relationship to his people is one of unqualified love. 
He has chosen and redeemed us because his desire is towards us. We are the objects of his eternal love. This metaphor also confronts us with our responsibility to be single-minded in our devotion to God and to recognize the gravity of giving our affections and loyalty to other things, not least our own ambitions and interests. God's love is so deep that it cannot tolerate rival affections. Group, the thought that the church is like the bride of Christ should stimulate us to strive for greater purity and holiness, and also greater love for Christ and submission to Him. God's love for us as the the as a I love my wife. Oh, I miss I miss her so much. I don't deserve my wife. Um, she, she's a crown upon my head. I, I love her with every ounce of my being. I tell my daughters all the time, uh, that, you know, uh, I love you so much, but your mother, she is my joy and my treasure. And I want them to know that that's what, how a husband should speak to about his wife. But guys, my love for my wife doesn't hold an ounce to God's love for his people. He loves them despite their ugliness and rebellion. His love for us is truly unqualified, and he's committed himself to present, Christ has committed himself as a good husband to present his bride, the church, uh, pure, white, sanctifying us in the truth of his word. We, as a good bride, look to follow that leadership and to live in single-minded devotion our husband, to our uh, Savior, uh, and to recognize that giving our affections to anything else is nothing short of adultery. Um, and God's faithfulness stays. Let's not be a people, though, that are marked by adulterous thoughts, wandering affections. Uh, let's be a people who are marked by just amaze, amazement that we get to be married and connected to um, the Lord Jesus Christ.